do it everything. It's amazing. Sometimes technology works. Um, anyway, hi, welcome to the 10th anniversary uh, of Darren's Guitar Chronicles posting online um, live chat celebration. So um, anyone who's out there, if you want to drop a comment into the live chat window in YouTube, I can see it. On Facebook, I don't think I can see it, or they may pop up, but they may disappear again before I can see them again, because it only shows me myself, I, which seems like not the best interface, but okay. Um, okay, Facebook. <laughs> uh, but thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, so uh, if you're just joining the Darren train, which some people are, um, uh, I've been posting it online for 10 years now, um, two times a week, pretty much without fail, except for there was a hiatus of a couple of months at one point. When was that? That was um, right at the end of book five, basically. And then uh, there were two different summers where I also took went down to halftime, where I just did one chapter a week instead of two. Um, uh, in all the 10 years that it's been posting, we've been through every different kind of sort of up and down in the internet. So um, in you know 2009, when we first got started, people still read blogs. Social media was still kind of only just barely getting going. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really interesting that, uh, and now, you know, blogs are not so much a thing. Um, online newsletters have become a thing. So now people who are doing serialization, some of them are going straight to like serializing through like an email, you know, episode lands in your inbox and you know some things like that and what I like about posting online is that you know people can leave comments they can kind of interact they can interact with each other they can interact with me they can interact with Darren um, we've been posting on Wattpad um, for quite a while now and uh, um, Chris who I can see is in the chat um, helped me to get all the backlog because we had six years worth of backlog or something, you know, to be posted there. So, so she actually took over posting it every single day until the backlog was caught up. And now she still keeps up with the two, two, you know, two chapters a week, um, making sure that things go live there. And, uh, which is great because I would never remember to do it, um, in a timely fashion. <laughs> it would be as it is the way that the posting works on, um, you know, on, the regular Darren website, I am able to preload the chapters so that they post at the proper time, assuming that the web server doesn't crash and that daylight savings, for example, doesn't completely mess us up. It used to post at noon, but it was already, we were off by an hour actually. And so it was actually at 11 and then we moved it back to 10. And then somehow in a daylight savings daylight standard time changeover, it went to 9 a.m. And then I just left it at 9 a.m. because why not? Um, and uh, that's probably where it will stay. But yeah, so I, I preload this in the morning. I do not get up at nine in the morning and hit publish um, because it would just be, it would be late every single day um, if I did that. <laughs> so like Darren, I am not a morning person. So at 4 a.m., I'm usually setting it up and, you know, test, testing the, that the links work and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, it, it's interesting. People keep, people keep joining the train, no matter how many cars are on the train, you know, there are always people who are hopping on um, and it's been kind of fun lately. There's a couple of folks who are uh, binge reading the entire thing on Wattpad and um, and leaving comments. And what was interesting is they were reading it two two it was two particular people who were leaving a lot of comments, and they were reading at two different rates. But but the one that was further behind was reading faster, and now they have caught up in their sort of. So now I see them comment to each other every now and then. It's kind of fun. Um, but. Uh, but it is a marathon, you know, it's sort of now when it used to be people would be like, oh, I've been binging your thing all weekend. And now it's like, I haven't slept for two weeks. And <laughs> you know, it's, we're not quite depending on how fast you read. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, you know, gonna be a million and a half words pretty soon, which is um, like, if you read all of Harry Potter and Cursed Child and the Fantastic Beasts, screenplays, you know, back to back. That's basically about the length that we're at now. Still not anywhere close to, say, um, uh, The Song of Ice and Fire by George R.R. R. Martin, you know, where every book is, you know, a tome like this, and then there's several of them, and, and he's not done. So, um, you know, I, I'm not done either, obviously. <laughs> so I think I think a year ago, I said, okay, we're going into the final year. But it's, 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 maybe it's a year in Darren time instead of in our time. I don't know. I, I thought it was going to be a year. And I've been wrong every time in the whole 10 years we've been doing this, whenever I've tried to predict when something will come up. And I've always been, and I'm usually off by a factor of two or three. So I'll be like, yeah, that's gonna come around in you know, like two months and then six months later, um, something will happen. So 
So you just never know. I'm, uh, I'm just, I, Darren's time moves much more slowly than ours. Um, and there's not a lot of skips. Like if it were a traditional novel, there would be, you know, um, something would happen at Thanksgiving and then like the next chapter would be like, you know, well, nothing much happened until Christmas and then, you know, whatever. And like weeks would have gone by. That just doesn't happen in his world um, in the way his narration works, because it's in that quote unquote downtime when all the change really occurs. Right. So um, it's funny. I'm, I'm in the middle of writing a book right now that is uh, the binge watchers guide to Harry Potter. And it's, it's about the Harry Potter movies. And um, but a lot of the, stuff is about how did things from the book get translated into the um into the you know the film versions and it's funny i watched it a great video that said a conversation between jk rowling and steve clovis who was the screenwriter and you know they had a very close working relationship where they just emailed each other constantly you know um he would ask her for advice or what's this or you know how should I do this? Or can I leave this character out? Or can I combine these two characters together and still get the same effect? And, you know, or will this, this, they both be important later and, you know, that kind of thing. And she, um, she told him all kinds of stuff. And uh, one of the things that she said was, you know, later when I went back and looked at the novels, I realized there were all these times where I was like, you know, um, just skipping forward, you know, two months. And she's like, what it, was it really realistic that in two months, you know, Harry and his friends wouldn't have had a single incident or wouldn't have, you know, whatever. And she's like, and you know, because it was sort of the school calendar, it's like, you know, September 1st, they would go to Hogwarts and then there's always, you know, Halloween and, and, uh, you know, then, then exams and then Christmas and, you know, so forth and so on. And it's just funny because, um, you know, then yeah, you skip suddenly skip two months, and he it, he said, well, actually, it's quite easy to do that in the movies because they would just have like a little montage where it's like, oh, you know, it's sunny, and then all of a sudden it starts to snow, you know, or whatever, and it's like it's very ob easy visually to be like time has passed, um, and <laughs> you know, and every every different director did it a slightly different way. Um, you know, when you're writing, you have to just be like, well, now I just have to come out and tell you time has passed. Darren usually comes out and tells you, I have no idea how much time passed, you know, and actually it's only been three days, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's like the only time Darren remembers what time it is, is when someone's reminding him on a daily basis. Um, you know, like today is Tuesday, you know, July 3rd and you are in Cleveland, you know, so <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, that's what makes the most sense to his world. And that's what makes sense to, you know, most people um, in the world, you know, he doesn't have, the rest of us have like a Monday through Friday kind of schedule where, right. It's like, you know, you have to be at work and then you've got your, you know, your Zumba class or your, you know, you're taking your kids to soccer three nights a week, but then, you know, Fridays is this other thing. And then of course, Saturday and Sunday have these separate schedules and, you know, and he, and he just doesn't have that. He has this other, other way of existing. Um, and it's a, you know, it's an alternate way of existing. It's kind of fun. Um, but it's interesting for me trying to get into that mindset sometimes where I'm just like, well, for me, it's like, I've got to, every day I have to be figuring out, okay, and then what am I doing tomorrow and the day after and, you know, whatnot to sort of stay on time and stay on deadline. And, you know, life of a writer is a little bit different. Um, and especially at being a sort of self-employed writer, doing a lot of self-publishing and whatnot, it's like, you really have to be self-motivated in a way that, um, that not, not every you know, that most day jobs don't, don't need you to be that self-motivated. And then even when you are under contract to a big publisher and whatever, it's still on you, you know, they give you a due date of, you know, 18 months from now, it's still on you to make the time to actually, to actually do the work. So, you know, um, uh, it's a life that I love, I, you know, I love being able to kind of figure out my own schedule and whatnot, but it's, someone described it recently as, um, it's like having homework every night. And, uh, you know, as an adult, and it's like, well, if you as a kid really hated, um, you know, I, I could put it more, it's more like having term papers to write, you know, it's more like you're in college, and you know, you know, you have to turn in this 30 page paper by October 15th, you can't write it all the night before, can you, you know, well, probably not. And so what are you going to do? You've got to plan out your time and figure out how you're going to get it done. You know, um, you've got a project to do, you know, how do you make sure that it gets finished? And you know, that's basically what the life of a writer is. It's, you know, homework, homework all the time. <laughs> so, um, but I, but I love that. So, um, and it's great because like being not a morning person and, you know, so forth, I don't get up in the morning and go to a job or need to be at a meeting at, you know, 10 every morning or something. It's, uh, you know, if I write until eight in the morning, 
then I'm going to sleep until four in the afternoon unless I haven't, unless I have a conference call or an appointment or, you know, something which does happen, but you know how it is. Um, yeah, you run smack into regular life needing you to be places. But, uh, but for me, since I don't have kids and, you know, I'm not, fortunately that is not every day. Um, but, uh, okay. So if anyone has questions you want to ask, put them in the chat in YouTube. Um, you can also text me. Um, uh, I'm, I used to have a little sign with my phone number on it. Um, I'm trusting you all with my phone number. So you can, you can text me and it will pop up in my little, I have a little window here that shows me my texts. Um, 617, that's Boston's area code, right? 617-290-9043. And um, there's a question now. Uh, it's from, uh, from H.B. Kurtzwild, one of my favorite, uh, I won't even say M.M., one of my favorite gay, queer, out of this world um, writers. Uh, so I would highly recommend you check out his stuff if you uh, are out there um, looking for more reading material because Darren isn't enough. You only get two chapters a week and they're short. Um, uh, yeah, it says, how are the cats? The cats are pretty good. I, I would be surprised if Oolong doesn't at some point jump up here and try to get his face in the camera because um, that's what he does. Where he's like, you're doing something and you're not paying attention to me, but the moment he's not here. Um, so yeah, he, uh, there, one of the three, my three cats died earlier this year. Um, Puer, their, their, their biggest of the three brothers, um, uh, had a kidney infection and you know, whatnot. He had, he had bladder stones for his entire life. So he lived a pretty good long, you know, life for a, uh, you know, almost till 10, um, as a, as a chronically ill cat. And, uh, um, but now the other two, are trying to renegotiate all the territory in the whole house. And it's just like, you know, and they're the two that, they're the two who spent the most time together. So I keep finding them together, you know, look like each other's faces and whatever, but then they're like, oh wait, but you know, who's allowed to sit on whose lap when and whatever. It's like they had to renegotiate their whole, like all the territories in the house because now it's just the two of them and how are they going to split it up? And it's just, I don't know. There's, it's like very political somehow how these guys function just, you know, sibling rivalry, <laughs> you know, but, um, but yeah, they're doing well. And, uh, they're, it's cold here now, it's freezing. Um, and it's daylight savings. So it's dark, you know, at four forty-five in the afternoon, it's pitch dark here already. And, um, you know, for some reason in my mind, I always think, oh, it doesn't really get that dark until like Christmas time. No, it really, it, it happens basically overnight as soon as the time change comes. So, um, you know, so, so now I have nothing to keep me on any kind of a regular schedule because there's not enough sunlight to reset my internal clock at all. So, you know, so I'm just, I'm writing all night, hopefully, you know, trying to get as much work done while I'm in that state before I collapse as possible. Um, you know, the, the cats though are like, oh, it's cold. So now all of a sudden after having basically shunned my lap for the entire summer, all of a sudden they want to be in my lap while I'm typing and they like to, like, I'll, I'll be typing and Oolong likes to hang on this arm. And it's literally giving me a repetitive strain injury in my elbow. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to shift him, at least shift him to the other arm. Sometimes it's got to be this arm. I don't understand why. Yeah, he's a nut. But it's funny talking about repetitive strain. Um, I was going back, and so what I do when I'm writing, um, you know, I write Darren's chapters happen sort of incrementally. These different changes happen in his mind, and different incidents happen to him. Um, but I go back and I reread a lot. Um, to kind of make sure I'm picking up threads and, you know, this and that. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are sort of left open-ended that take a long time. I mean, both years in our time and in his time to come back around on the guitar, as it were, um, you know, that there are themes that are building up or, you know, uh, I don't know. It, it, you can't even talk about it in terms of Chekhov's guns because, you know, the, you, you know, the, the famous quote is that if there's a gun on the table in a play and, you know, act one, it has to be fired in the final act. Right. And it's like when you're writing a serial that goes on for 10 years, <laughs> you know, it's just um, things sometimes take a really long time to come around. And um, some of them are just, it's just a long list of things to deal with. Right. So I'll be, going along, I'll be rereading, you know, whatnot, and I'll realize, wow, you know, actually, this one's been going on for a very long time. And uh, one of the things that it hit me just how long it's been going on is, first of all, I, it, Claire has been dying for a very long time. I know this is true. Um, so, you know, but, uh, but it's how long Darren's been dealing with sort of these chronic 
injuries, you know, what, what started out as acute injuries and then are now chronic injuries, right? Where he's still like, feels like he hasn't regained the dexterity in one hand. And then, you know, the other thumb has the problem, you know, and whatever. And he's like, I depend on my hands to do what I do. I also depend on my hands working to do what I do. And I'm realizing that a lot of my, duh, of course, a lot of my anxiety about my ability to continue my creative work is coming out through his anxiety about his ability to do his creative work. What a shock, you know, but I, somehow I didn't see it until I was rereading, you know, something from 200 chapters ago last night while I was putting some stuff together, you know, or like when these pe people are, when people are rereading and they're leaving comments in the previous chapters and I'm answering their comments, sometimes I go back and I reread those chapters, right? So I'm like, what are they talking about? I have to read it <laughs> to find out, right? And it's like, oh yeah, okay. So, you know, my health is, is not a direct parallel to Darren's health, but there are obviously things going on. Um, one of the questions somebody emailed me in advance before um, today to say, you know, here's, here's a question for your Q and A um, is about my parents. Um, and, and it's funny cause this one comes up. It seems like it comes up a lot. Um, is people are like, what's your, what's your relationship with your parents? Like, because Darren's relationship to his parents is obviously super messed up, <laughs> you know, in so many different ways. Um, and uh, my standard answer is that actually this is one of the things that I think is not parallel in any way that my relationship with my parents is actually really, really great to the point where there's no conflict there for me to use in writing <laughs> because my, my parents are just super great. And, and you know, the, uh, um, they're super supportive. My, my mom lives in a, um, you know, they both live in a, uh, gated community now, you know, for retirees in Florida and, um, they have a book club and my mom invites me down once a year to like come and speak to her book club. So they've read, um, uh, they read slow surrender, which is one of my, you know, 50 shades of gray type erotica rom erotic romance novels. And, um, you know, boy, that was an interesting one, you know, nothing like, uh, you know, answering questions about, about the BDSM lifestyle for, you know, an hour, which is, which I normally do do. I'm, I teach classes, you know, this and that and the other, but it's the first time I had done it for my mom's friends. So it was a little different um, than I think your average romance writer probably gets. Um, but yeah, I have a super great, relationship with my parents who have always been very supportive of me being creative and me finding my own way and you know so forth so it's um you know uh so so uh, i so someone was like um in a previous chat was basically like well so then what do the parents represent in in the book and i said i think they're representative of societal expectations um you know and my parents fortunately did not expect me to conform to society's uh, rules or anything. Um, they would have been perfectly happy if I had, but the fact that I didn't, you know, they were happy to go along with whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever I was going to do. Right. As long as I got good grades and, you know, whatnot. So, um, yeah, my parents have been super supportive, but yeah. So I think, I think Claire and Digger both represent sort of societal expectations in different ways. And, um, you know, Digger both has that aspect of, sort of toxic masculinity, um, as well as sort of capitalism, you know, and then, um, you know, Claire is sort of a, a different part of the expectation is sort of more of the, uh, um, and we're seeing it a lot in these latest chapters that her expectations for her daughters were much higher in a way than her expectations for her son, um, uh, as far as like behavior and comportment and, you know, so forth and so on, even though she was very resentful of the choices that she was essentially, she was, she wasn't allowed to make choices. Um, you know, when she was growing up, she was essentially forced to marry and forced to move to the suburbs and forced to give up her career as a performer and, you know, so forth and so on because of societal expectations. So it's like, and then that she turns around and sort of, you know, is still part of that system is, you know, sort of interesting. Um, and it's only now that Darren is starting to realize that, hey, you know, my mom didn't really want to be such a bitch, <laughs> you know, but um, she kind of had no choice in a way, you know, it's like, um, she's still, I mean, as crazy as a shithouse rat, but it's, you know, uh, but he at least understands a little bit more about her <laughs> than he did, you know, a year ago or two years ago, you know, and so forth. But um but, uh, but yeah, so, so one of these questions was about, um, parental, parental anxiety, you know, whatnot. And, um, the answer, to the, 
I can't read my own handwriting now of the question. I wrote it on a notepad, so I didn't print this one out. Um, the uh, oh, yeah, anxiety over. I think that's this says anxiety over parents aging. Um, absolutely, my own anxiety about my parents aging um, it is is coming out now in in Darren's whole anxiety about his you know his mother's illness. Um, and there's no, no question about that. I mean, um, my dad's got Alzheimer's. Um, so, uh, you know, he and my mom are both going through that right now. She's his main caregiver. Um, she's had various health issues as time has gone on. She's had heart arrhythmia, um, you know, knee replacement, you know, that'd be just like diff different things. Um, and, uh, I think maybe we finally, convinced her that she has to tell us when she's going to the hospital before she goes as opposed to waiting till after it's all done and then being like oh and by the way I had a hip surgery you know <laughs> and um you know just because uh you know we'd like to know and be prepared sort of you know what might be happening so 100% I'm sure a lot of my you know subconscious anxiety is becoming conscious through Darren's anxiety about um you know what's going to happen with his mother so yeah no, no question about that um, I, uh, you know, so yeah, so Darren's parents are not my same time. You know, this is one issue where, where we are, I think. So anyone else got questions? Remember, put them in the chat in the YouTube window or text them to me. Can't see them in Facebook. I don't think, um, the, uh, it, it doesn't show me that part. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Facebook, it, it'll show me like, if you hit the, like the little like button, I think little hearts will float across the screen or something, but I don't <laughs> <laughs> that's which is nice but it's not that communicative <laughs> so um all right uh oh my gosh 856 already all right so um actually you know what i didn't check because i never checked email again today because i've been out and i was teaching and you know so forth is um never checked sort of what suggestions may have come in for um for what chapter i should read um so let me know if you guys have thoughts about that um, because I did not pick one in advance. Um, all right. So I, I did one little thing that I realized that it's 2019 right now. If this is the 10th anniversary, right, then um, that means we started in 20, 2009. And uh, that means that, you know, whereas one of the big significant years in DGC, right, is that that was 1989, right? So it's like all these years that end in nine. I think it's just coincidence, but um, yeah. So 1989, 1999, 2009, and 2019, um, I decided I would go back and look at each of these years to see what was the, like what was the, the most popular song of the year. Um, 2019 has already definitely had its most popular song. I don't know if you've been following the whole saga with uh, Old Town Road. Um, talk about a surprising, you know, surprising entry. Um, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Lil Nas X, um, you know, basically a, a black rapper did a country song and then there was much, let's say, sturm und drang among, you know, country music stations and, you know, so forth and so on about whether they were going to play it and because racism, um, and, you know, this, that, and the other. And then Billy Ray Cyrus, who, you know, Miley Cyrus's dad and also one of the top, you know, names in country re-recorded the song as a duet with him. And so it, it, literally on the, on the billboard charts, it's like old town road hits number one. And, you know, with just Lil Nas X as the name. And then the next week it's with Billy Ray Cyrus, <laughs> you know, where it was like, you know, um, interesting way to get for Billy Ray Cyrus to get himself into the top 40. Um, but, uh, and it's, and it's great. They did a goofy video, you know, whatnot like that. And they're basically just like, you know, um, I'm all, I'm here for it. I'm, <laughs> I'm all for it. Um, yeah, kind of fun. So, uh, anyone want to guess what the top song of 2009 was? Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's funny cause there were actually two songs tied for most number ones and they're both by the same band and the band is black eyed peas um 2009 i got a feeling and boom boom pow were both like several weeks each you know and, and concurrent on uh, at number one so it was like uh, like the whole summer and fall basically um was all black eyed peas 
and it was just all black eyed peas all the time. <laughs> so, and it's like, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, that's right. 2009, you know, like I did a lot of that summer. I, I had to drive to a lot of things and, you know, whatever. It was a lot of, I had just gotten XM radio and it was like, didn't matter which channel you put on though. It was like, you know, I got a feeling had made it into every different format. It was, you know, um, the, <laughs> H.B. Kurtzweil, Old Town Road is the theme for Walker to the Sun. Yes! Uh, Walker is a book that H.B. is in the middle of working on and that I'm in the middle of working on because Circlet Press will be publishing it soon, very soon. Um, all right, let's go back to 1999. Um, there's a little bit of a tie, but the, the definitely the number one song, Santana with Rob Thomas Smooth. <laughs> so... Um, uh, which was sort of like the resurgence of Carlos Santana. People were like, what? Carlos Santana is still alive? That's right. Not everyone died of a drug overdose in the 60s. Um, you know, uh, and then honorable mention goes to Ricky Martin with Living La Vida Loca and Christina Aguilera, Jeannie in a Bottle, um, which is just super interesting to me. Um, that it was sort of three, you know, Latin flavored, you know, kind of songs were, were all hitting the top of the charts. I mean, these are number one songs in the Billboard Top 40 in 1999. Then we looked, I looked back in 1989 and I was like, yeah, what, what was the top song of, you know, 1989? And the funny thing is there isn't one. Almost every week had a different number one song. They're in all different genres. And the one song that maybe kind of could be counted is Janet Jackson had a song that was uh, number one for four weeks. That was it. Um, and, uh, and I can't, and I didn't even write down what song it is. It's like not one of her better songs even, you know? And it was like, that's the kind of chaos that was going on in 1989. It's like, nobody knew, nobody knew what they wanted. Nobody knew what they liked. Sales were all over the place. And that was before, and that was before true, um, true sales scanning. It was before everything was barcoded and before everything was sort of like in a massive sales database. So you had to kind of trust different things. So one of the reasons why I think there were so many different number ones is because the chart was manipulated. Um, so it's interesting that once it goes to, uh, you know, once sound scan comes along in the early nineties, it was like, Oh, and now things that are popular, you can actually see are popular and that their popularity then is maintained by <laughs> continued sales. Once something hits number one, which is what you would have thought would have been true. Right. So um, let's see. Will we get any insight into what Colin and the band have been doing while Darren is gone? It certainly would have been a different level of contact in the cell phone era. Yeah, it's true. It's like when they, when these guys go on the road, it's like, you know, they're just gone. <laughs> you know, you just don't hear from them. You get a postcard maybe once in a while. You can page them. The whole thing with Darren and Ziggy paging each other with different codes that meant different things. Like, you know, they would page each other 411. I just need information or 911. I'm having an emergency or you know, I can't even remember all the little codes that they've come up with that mean different things, you know, and whatnot. And um, by the next year, they're going to start to get better communication too. You know, it's like right now in 1992, they're still, it's still kind of the car phone era and um, people who have, have cell phones are starting to carry, but you have to basically like carry a briefcase with you that has the battery pack and stuff in it. And it's just, you know, yeah, so there's the car phone, the bus phone, you know, whatnot, but there isn't really the personal mobile phone yet, um, but it's coming, right? You know, it's coming. Um, the, uh, um, I mean, like, here they are, they're like, they, they can't leave the hospital practically because they're like, what if we can't reach us, you know? Um, so it's like, they have to go somewhere where they can be reached or that where they can be paged, you know? And then, of course, there was that whole issue, I don't know if you all remember the days when you could go to a place where your pager didn't work or your cell phone even didn't work. I mean, I remember when I first started running conventions, um, which is not that long ago, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, the late, early 2000s, late 90s and early 2000s. And at one point I went to run a con in, um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and, uh, and I couldn't get long distance service there. And it was like, I had to go through, I had to jump through a bunch of hoops in order to, you know, it's like I, they didn't have like the, the local tell, you know, telco didn't have an agreement with whoever my carrier was, you know, at Sprint or something, you know, whatever, so that, that they could, so that I could just roam and pay money. You know, I had to set up a whole thing. It was ridiculous. Um, 
and I was like, I, you know, I can't not have my phone on me use, usable while I'm, you know, well, in the old days, what you did was you had to pick up the house phone in each different function room, you know, and whatever, or you, they, the, the, the hotel would give you a little radio so you could radio back and forth to the, uh, you know, uh, to the front desk and, you know, whatnot. It was just, then eventually they went to Nextel and they would give you a Nextel phone that had a phone number and also, you know, the, the push to talk kind of thing. It was like, we did that for a couple of years. It's just, yeah. I don't miss uh, running conventions. I, I love doing it, but it's, it was so high stress. It was just, it was wrecking my health. Um, and I just had to stop. And I love being on the road. I love traveling. I love putting things together, you know, and I just, but I just couldn't. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so yeah, will we get any insight into what Colin and the, and the band have been doing while Darren is gone? Probably at some point, somebody will say something to him about things or there'll be, you know, I don't know, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that we're going to find out that much because Darren doesn't retain a lot of information about things that are out of sight, out of sight for him or things are out of sight, out of mind, you know? So, um, you know, he kind of knows that life goes on, you know, um, when, when he's not there, but he doesn't, unless something, you know, important happens, like, I don't know, Colin decides to get married, moves out of the house or, you know, something like that. He's, he's sort of, he's sort of, Darren at least is assuming that things are just, the status quo is being maintained while he's gone. Um, so, which is pretty true, you know, um, for the most part. Um, the, uh, it's interesting because Colin is one of those characters who is very constant you know, he isn't going through a lot of ups and downs. And if he is, you aren't seeing them because the portion of him that interfaces with Darren's world is, is just very, very constant. His, like his hair color, you know, and whatever and style changes, but Colin doesn't change, you know. Um, he's older, so he's already gone through a lot of, the, you know, he, he's done with the ups and downs of your 20s of figuring out stuff, you know. So, and he's, you know... Um, uh, and he's settled into a kind of, well, you know, he doesn't think he's the marrying kind, you know, whatever. Um, the one thing that has changed in Colin's life and that has been surprising to both him and Darren is that their relationship keeps getting, you know, seems to keep getting a deeper emotional components, um, which neither of them expected, you know, and so forth. And it's funny because, of course, commenters have seen it coming. They're just like, well, duh, what did you guys think was going to happen? <laughs> you know, it's like, um, you know, I don't know, you know. That's what happens when you get, you know, characters who are not fully engaged in, in touch with all of their emotions, you know, and that's what's fun about it is that you get to be right <laughs> when you're like, I told you that was going to happen. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, all right, guys, what, which chapter should I read? Because I, I want to, I want to give you one um, before it gets too late. Um, I mean, I'll pick it out, I should probably pick it out now and then I'll. Um, I'll re I'll do that last. Um, all right. Nobody has texted, at least not about that. Actually, I should make sure that I don't have any texts in between these various ones from Corwin's final line is way back from the office. I thought you guys would like to know that. <laughs> he works from home also. So we're mostly home all the time, but he went to an office today. And was, so it was like a novelty to him to have to go somewhere. <laughs> You know, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're living the, the life we thought we would be living, you know, in the, in the 80s, where we're like, wouldn't it be great if we could just kind of connect through, you know, of course, that was the cyberpunk era, we thought we were going to be connecting via, you know, plugs into our brains, we're not quite there yet. But, you know, how much closer can you get, then you can, like we're doing right now, you know, have an interface with a camera and, you know, so forth and so on. And I know people who co work with people who are, on different continents, you know, and so forth. And, and, you know, in real time through, um, video conferencing and, you know, sharing files and, you know, this, that, and the other, it's just, I know people are writing music like that who are doing, you know, I mean, it, not just, not just office-y kind of stuff too. And it's, um, it's amazing. Um, the, just the number of things that are no longer tied to our geography, um, music has changed drastically um, in that you don't have to go to a studio at a, you know, some famous location and hire some famous producer. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Mac, you know, buy yourself a Mac laptop and it comes with a bunch of software in it. And then there are, of course, 
higher quality software tools that you can use. And um, a, uh, a friend of mine, um, it's like his daughter's 16 and, um, and she's basically doing what Billie Eilish did. You know, she's producing her own music at home, basically in her bedroom, kind of. Um, uh, actually, she's moved up now from doing it herself in her bedroom to she's got a producer and, uh, you know, uh, people working with her, you know, and whatnot. But um, her name's Lorelai Marcel. Uh, my friend's name is Sean. And he's like, this is what my daughter's doing right now, <laughs> you know. And uh, and there, there are a couple of other, you know, and she's... She's like, a, you know, she's at a high, public high school in Massachusetts and, you know, all the other kids in the high school are like, oh, you know, this is our YouTube star, you know, kind of a thing. And it's just, um, yeah, it's just amazing. And uh, I was uh, talking with a guy who was like, yeah, I'm a music producer. And I was like, oh, you know, where do you work? And he's like, I work in my bedroom. You know, <laughs> and he's like, people upload files. I, you know, he does his magic, you know, whatever. And he downloads them back to them. And there's no... You know, he doesn't sit in a booth working the dials or, you know, any of that kind of engineering stuff anymore. He's like, they just send it all to me. I put it together. I send it back, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, you can still obviously make an album in the traditional way where you all get together. He's like, but that's, he's like, that's not the standard for most of the music that's being made, even at, apparently at the, you know, the top 40 level and whatnot. So it's just, just interesting um, how it changed. All right. Chris wants to know any updates on republishing the books? Yes. Soon. Um, I had to get this Harry Potter thing out of the way first um, before I can get back to that. And I, um, I started, uh, I, there's a couple of the covers are going to need to be changed because the size that I have isn't quite right for the cropping that I want to do for, to put the new logo in. And then that opened a can of worms of me basically looking at all the art and being like, oh, you know, I have to redo it all. Um, so uh, I should just, I should drop that project and just go back to trying to make it work with the old old covers with the, just a new logo title, title, you know, title logo. Um, because, yeah, because <laughs> uh, it's been a while. And, and we're behind now by a couple of books. Um, in fact, we're behind by like two whole Kickstarters at this point. So I need to um, probably this coming year in 2020. Um, we'll run a Kickstarter and we'll get caught up. Um, and then that will sort of put the money in the bank to finish off all of the, um, the, the omnibus books and, you know, other stuff like that. Um, while as we go sort of move toward the finale, whatever that may be. Um, the, uh, the one thing I really would like to do is um, raise a little money and see if we can get Teddy Hamilton, who was the narrator of the audiobooks, to do um, more audiobooks. Um, because, uh, uh, and I, and I'm, I am now peripherally in touch with him. He, Teddy Hamilton is a, is a pseudonym and then he, he narrates different, uh, genres under different names and whatnot. But I finally met, I met a, another narrator who knows him. She's like, you know, email me and I'll put you guys in touch. Um, because I would love to see if we could afford him. Cause I, if we're going to keep doing the audiobooks, I would like to, and I thought he did quite a nice job. Um, it was a little hard for me to listen to them because you know, you're, you're supposed to be able to listen to an audiobook. you know, like people are like, oh, I listen to them while driving or while cleaning and, you know, this and that. And it's like, I had a weekend, the way Audible used to do it when they would buy the rights to do a thing. So they pay the narrator, they paid the, you know, whatever. Um, they had bought the rights to the first three books and then they, they send you the sample books. They want you to listen to them and, and like approve them. Right. And I would be like vacuuming or something. And then the next thing I know, I'd be standing there listening because I would get caught up in the story and I would be like, how long have I been standing here? And then I tried to listen to them driving to New York and I almost drove off the road, I think two different times. And I was like, okay, I cannot, I can listen to other people's audiobooks and podcasts and, you know, whatever. I cannot listen to my own books because my mind goes off somewhere else. <laughs> you know, and I was just like, that is not a good idea. So um, yeah, to, word to the wise, don't do that. Um, <laughs> because it's, uh, yeah, I, maybe not every author will be, you know, affected that way. And maybe I wouldn't be affected by every one of my books that way. But Darren, definitely, I was just like, whew. you know, my, my mind was not on the road at all, you know, and um, yeah, the merit, Park, I almost lost it in the Merritt Park way at least twice. So, um, so now I know I don't do that, <laughs> you know, but all right. What else do I have on my, uh, on my to-do list here? Okay. All right. Let's see. Chris says, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apparently I answered it, whatever it was. Um, let's uh, check my notes. 
Um, let's pull up a chapter for you guys. Um, should I read tomorrow's chapter, which hasn't even appeared yet? Would, would that be good? Um, and like, I obviously can't read one from next week because you haven't seen tomorrow's. I don't actually remember which chapter is next week because I, I usually set up three, four chapters in advance sort of to give myself some buffer. Um, and when it doesn't work, it's because the website crashed and I didn't notice because then I, I already set my stuff up. <laughs> um, we haven't, knock wood, we haven't had a crash now for a couple of, several months. And um, it, what tends to happen is the second Corwin and I leave town, the web server crashes. So, you know, so we're not home to reboot it. And um, I know it, it, the, the server is literally in our basement. Um, I should probably move to cloud hosting or, you know, whatever one of these days, but, but have I? No, um, <laughs> not yet. Still it's too old school for that. All right. I'm going to see what. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me, I'm going to read tomorrow's chapter just to give you guys a, a preview of it then. Um, this doesn't mean don't comment, of course. Gosh, I gotta get it to open. Uh -uh. All right, here we go. <clears throat> All right, so we're in Tennessee. Um, we're in the hospital. You know, uh, Darren's mother has you know, been dying for a while now of uh, pancreatic cancer and complications thereof. Um, she's drugged up a lot of the time uh, because she's, they've got her on, you know, like a morphine drip kind of thing where she can give herself more when she needs. Um, you know, it's 100% palliative care at this point where they don't think there's going to be a miracle turnaround. Um, and let's see. Uh -huh. And I, I don't, I actually don't remember what happens in this chapter now. <laughs> I remember part of it, but, um, so we'll find out together. <laughs> so right, the chapter is called, am I the same girl? I think a few more days went by long adagios of sitting with Claire broken up by sudden symbol crashes of phone calls that would ultimately fade back to silence. Maybe a week. The phone calls didn't tell us much, just who Barrett or Corinne or our lawyers had talked to, but nothing much was said. Meanwhile, Ziggy gave up harping on working on the non-existent song. Claire, Darren's mother, has asked him to write a song to be sung at her funeral, um, and he's having writer's block over it. Um, I found I could only practice on building up my calluses again when he wasn't there, he being Ziggy. We almost had a fight about it when I tried to tell him. Could you go on an errand with Courtney or something? He'd just gotten out of the shower and was toweling off with the door open to let steam out. What errand? I felt really anxious about asking this, and when he challenged it, my throat tightened. I don't know, just something. He sat on the edge of the bed, white hotel towel across his lap, and looked up at me. He looked calm, but do you need some time to yourself? It's not that. I, I, I need to practice, and I just can't when you're here. It's not like you to be self-conscious. Yeah, well, it's not every day you try to come back from something like this. I held up my hand, but it was closed in a fist, pressed to my chest. And it's not about me. It's just that you're too distracting. Now a little smile curved his lip. Should I go sit in the lobby and read for a while? I'll spend the whole time thinking about how you're sitting in the lobby, though, which was probably all right if all I was going to do was give my fingers a workout. I knew I wouldn't be able to write a song, though, if I was distracted thinking about him. Well, unless the song was about him, maybe. Back to Ziggy's point of view, or Ziggy's dialogue. Um, but you won't if I go somewhere else? Don't ask me to explain how my brain works, please. I found myself standing between his knees, him hugging me around the middle. I think about you all the time, even when you're right here. Then does it matter where I go? Yes, because it's just different. That was about as much of an explanation as I could make. He stood up and kissed me. No one likes people listening to them practice, he said. You're not crazy. I'm not worried about being nuts, just about getting my practice in, I said. I'm taking my book, and I'm going to the lobby, okay? He pulled on some clothes, half of which were probably mine. I'll come back when I get bored if you don't come get me first. 
So he took his book, which was some kind of fat thriller, set in Japan, maybe, judging by the title, and kissed me on the cheek and left me alone. The good news was that I could play for a good 15 to 20 minutes before my fingers hurt enough to be a distraction on their own. I was starting to work through a lot of routines that I had used as a teenager and in music school. Many of them I hadn't played in years, but it was like my brain riffled through the piano bench in the back of my head and dredged out a bunch of half-forgotten things. A couple of them I knew I probably had actual sheet music of somewhere, probably in Alston, which made me want to ask Bart to dig through my room and the piano bench looking for them because I wanted a benchmark of how I was doing. Was I at least back to the level I had been when I was 13, 14? The bad news was that the phone rang about 15 minutes after Ziggy had gone out. I answered it in case it was the hospital, of course, which was also why I didn't make any jokes when I did. Hello? It was a female voice, which only reinforced my thought that it was a nurse calling, except she only used my first name. Darren? Yes? I'm in your neck of the woods for some meetings, and I wanted to ask if there was any chance we could meet up for a drink. You and Ziggy, if possible. She paused, as just as I was about to ask who she was, and said, This is Patty Marshfield from BNC. Oh, I hadn't seen her in a couple of years, but I remembered her. Well, the main thing I remembered was that she had a very stylishly long, professional-looking overcoat and kind of blonde hair that had many shades of blonde in it. How are you? I'm great, she said emphatically. So, can we talk? You know I'm in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, right? She had to. She had called me. I know. Okay, look, I'm in Memphis, but it's not actually for any other reason other than I was hoping to talk with you guys. If you can't get away for an hour or two, I'm happy to meet you wherever, though. I'll come to you, or you can come here. That was a bit stunning, of course. You dragged your ass all the way from New York City down here just to talk face-to-face with us? I felt like I should have been suspicious, but it didn't feel like a sneaky move, more like the opposite. Um, I just feel like we're getting nowhere with all the middlemen, she said. I don't work well that way, and I get the feeling you don't either. Yeah, my mind was racing. I was probably trying to get her. It was probably her trying to trick us into negotiating without our representation, right? But it didn't feel like that. Except, wait, are you still reporting to Mills these days? She laughed, and it was like I could see the relief on her face. I could hear it that clearly. No, I'm head of division now, and I'm loving it. So she had the magic pen. Again, this should have made me suspicious, but I just it just didn't feel underhanded at all. Maybe because she wasn't Mills and didn't sound like him. That must be what Barrett meant when he said there was a shakeup at BNC. I could still hear her grinning. That's putting it mildly. If you really want the gory details, come grab a drink with me. Or let's not, if you'd rather not. The corporate org chart is not the most scintillating subject. Yeah, I bet. We don't have to talk official business at all. You ever been to the Sun Records studio? I haven't. Figured I would drop by there as long as I'm in town. I just want to get to know you better. If you want, we can just talk about music. Music, I heard myself say. Yeah, that thing BNC was kind of forgetting about for a while. Mills only cared about money. I think the money will take care of itself if we concentrate on the music. That was the kind of thing a politician would say, wasn't it? It sounded too good to be true. But politicians have to keep some of their promises, don't they? Let me check with Ziggy. I think we might be able to get away for a few hours. Does it have to be today? I'm here through Friday, at least, she said. Take my pager number and my hotel and let me know, all right? All right. I took down her number, and then I went out to the lobby, where Ziggy was curled up with an, on another very rectangular couch with a to-go cup of tea and his book. He looked up when I guess he sensed me coming. What's wrong? You want to drive into Memphis to meet Patty Marshfield? Right now? Um, sometime before Friday? I had no idea what day of the week it was, actually. Right now, if you really want, she just kind of showed up and, um, yeah. Ziggy hopped to his feet. I would love nothing more than to not spend the next six hours in the hospital. Cool. I'll tell Court and Remo that we're going to take a little trip. A surge of energy hit me then like a light switch had been flipped on inside my chest. Anything not to spend the next six hours sitting in the hospital. The prospect was suddenly thrilling. Besides, I wanted to look for a piece of sheet music. How convenient. Boy, he's really in his head in this one, isn't he? (laughs) He's so like, I need to find a piece of sheet music that may exist. (laughs) You know, but I don't know. That's, that's probably me also, you know, in times of crisis. I'm like, where's, you know, I don't know. What are these shoelaces made of? I don't know. There's always something going on in my brain. 
you know how it is. All right, we've got about five, six minutes left um, in the chat. Anything else you guys want to ask me, hit me with it now. Um, the uh, I was going to try to check email again, but I don't want to switch windows too many times because I may crash it. Um, the um, Let's see. I'm trying to think if there's something else I... Something else I was going to announce? Not really. The one thing I will say is that if you're um, if you're a fan of Harry Potter, this I just went out in my newsletter last night. Um, uh, the, my main newsletter, not the Darren newsletter. Um, I'm collecting uh, basically what do you call it? Like opinions, uh, tips, you know, etc. About binge watching the movies because I'm writing a binge watcher's guide. So uh, tips for throwing a party, how to introduce your kids to the film series, which of course get sort of more mature and darker as they go on, um, just like the books. Um, you know, so uh, if you visit, uh, if you visit ceciliatan.com, you, you will probably um, see a link to it or search through my Twitter feed or my, my Facebook feed, any of them. Um, and you'll, you should find it. There's a Google form basically that you can fill out. And, uh, I'm trying to get, um, 50 to hundred people to fill it out before the end of this week. Um, just, uh, and if you, if you fill it out, even if I don't use any of your suggestions, um, the old, you still get a free download of, uh, the first book in the magic university series, and you'll get an ebook of the actual, uh, binge watcher guide when it comes out. Um, and then people whose tips I actually do use in it will get a free paperback of it as well. So, um, so anyone who's interested in that, go do that. And, um, and if you can't find it, you know, text me or drop me an email and I will send you a link, um, directly to that Google form. Um, the, uh, the other thing I realized last night when I was sending out the newsletter, um, was that it had been a year since I had sent out a newsletter. And, you know, we talk about this, parallels between me and Darren and, you know, so forth and so on. But usually there are things that are happening, things that happened to me, you know, 20 years ago or what's happening to him, you know, in, in the concurrent time, right? Things that happened to me in the 90s are happening to him now and, you know, so forth. And, um, the thing that was odd to realize is that I just spent basically an entire year where I didn't update my newsletter, didn't update my website, didn't, didn't publish a book, you know, like I've had this lost year, where like Midori, me and Laura published Silk Threads in la last November and here it is this November and it's like a year just disappeared on me. Um, Circle Press has been in this holding pattern where I've been waiting for the, we're, we're merging with this bigger company and waiting for that paperwork to finish so that all of that, so that's all been on hold, but it's like while that was on hold, other stuff should be moving faster to take up the time. And it's like, and I don't know how much of it is just modern political context makes it so hard to concentrate or, you know, or what, but trying to write this book for tour where we agreed at the end of last year, okay, we're going to throw out the manuscript, start over, going to start over from scratch. I took six months off thinking about that. And then in the spring, my brain started to move again and I started replotting those characters and, you know, so forth, but I haven't sat down to start knitting that one yet, you know, and then, and then I had to crash write this Harry Potter book. So it's like the, um, uh, you know, so it's like, that's been six weeks of my life, you know, where that I was about to start writing this other thing, but it's like, it's a whole year. And Darren's having a lost year at the exact same time that, you know, he's basically just lost a year of his life in Tennessee, you know, where it's like, they went down there right before Christmas. Now it's in his time, it's basically about at the end of June. So it has not a whole year yet, but it's about to be right. So, and it's just like, um, and when you're younger, half a year is like a year when you're older, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, whatever it is, he's been off the road, uh, hasn't written, hasn't written a song, hasn't written anything, you know, hadn't even practiced or played the guitar in how many months. And now all of a sudden he's like, holy shit, it's the first time in my entire life that my calluses hurt. You know, it's like, he doesn't even remember when he first learned to play when he was 10, you know, um, how much it hurt and that, you know because it's been that long, you know, it's been more than half his life. Right. So I'm like, interesting because uh, it's not an exact analog, obviously, because to me, writing has never hurt. It's never been like, Oh, this is, this is painful, you know? And, and if you don't do it, you, you know, it's not like that. Um, it can be painful when you're just like, you know, Oh, I can't figure out where this is going or, you know, uh, whatever. But, um, and you know, you dredge up your own inner emotions and you know, whatnot, when your characters go through angst, you go through angst, but it's, you know, 
but it's a way of processing it, right? So, so it's just interesting that it's like, wait a second. So you're telling me that I just had a lost year, but I wrote DGC all through it and all through which I was writing Darren's last year. Yeah, I don't know. It should have been more obvious to me sooner, I guess. But because um, I knew he was going to have a lost year. I knew, but I didn't know it was going to take a year to get through, <laughs> you know, and that I was going to be having a lost year at the same time. That's not, I don't know. I sometimes wonder if I jinx myself in a way with my writing, you know, like um, like the, the slow, sur slow surrender, slow satisfaction, you know, that whole series, I'll start with slow. Those books took twice as long to write as any other books like them. And I was like, did I, how, did I subconsciously plant this idea in my head that they would be slow, you know? And then of course the tour book has been, you know, six years in the writing. So it wasn't even that slow. Um, Chris asked, does Darren's writer's block make you nervous? It doesn't make me nervous. Um, undoubtedly some of what he's going through, I knew he was going to have to have a, uh, you know, a period of writer's block at some point because that just has, I knew that would have to happen at some point in the story. I just didn't know when it was going to happen and that it's happening when he's going through this, you know, massive emotional upheaval of the, you know, potential loss of a parent um, is, you know, makes sense to me, but it's like, I don't know. I do kind of wonder when I lose my parents, am I going to go through a period where I just won't have anything? Um, and, it, I might, and it might not, because it might not be a direct parallel in the end. Um, so it doesn't make me nervous. Um, I mean, I'm probably having the fact that it's taken me six years to write this book, and now I'm starting it over, and, you know, whatever. It's probably the closest thing to writer's block I've ever had. Um, but then but then I keep writing these other books, you know, while that one while that one stuck, I write these other books. So it's like Darren hasn't really been stuck, you know, um, the uh, the... Uh, I wrote that Navy SEAL book. I wrote, you know, <laughs> whatever. It's like, I wrote that whole book in, you know, six weeks or whatever. Um, so it's kind of, it's interesting because it's just, it's not a direct analog, but it is undoubtedly, you know, part of me working out my stuff, um, I'm sure. And I, I'm sure I, I can go back to every single page and out of all million words of Darren's Guitar Chronicles and pick out something where I'm just like, yep, that was me working out this and that was me working out that. And some of them, you know, I know at the time and some of them I just, I don't know until hindsight, you know maybe they're much more obvious to other people. Corwin reads it also because he's like, that's how I keep up with what's going on with you. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so, so be it, you know, it's like, it's, it's a direct look into my subconscious, you know, what's Darren doing? All right. It's nine thirty one, So I should probably say good night to all of you. Um, uh, uh, we may be off to a Harry Potter themed cocktail hour now. I don't know. Um, uh, because that's what our life is like, <laughs> you know? So um, if not, uh, you know, I'll see you all around in the comments at Darren's Guitar Chronicles. Um, well, like I said, it's 10 years. It's not over um, because there's a bunch more still to do. Um, and, and like I said, people are like, when's going to end? We'll know when we get there and you'll be there with me. Alrighty. So Thank you all for joining me tonight, and um, I'm going to end the live streams now so that then other people can come watch the uh, the archives. So thanks a bunch. Good night. Good night, Chris and Chris and HB and everyone else who is in the other streams and Facebook. I can't actually see who's there. Okay. Bye.